like to start with a brief story that I've seen in many different traditions. And in this one, several centuries ago, a bishop was traveling in remote areas and passed a little island and stopped in for refreshments. There were three uh, three fishermen there who explained that centuries earlier they had been uh, Christianized by missionaries and they had been taught the Lord's Prayer but they forgot it and what they were saying now was you know we are three and you are three have mercy upon us so they said please teach us what we're we've forgotten and of course the the missionary was uh, the bishop was appalled and he set them straight and he told them how to say the Lord's Prayer and they were poor learners but he gave them they gave it all they had, and he sailed off feeling very gratified that he had saved some souls. Well, as it happened months later, he was passing through the same area, and um, he was saying his prayers on deck, and he noticed a spot of light in the Far East, and, and it was coming towards him and towards him, and as it got close enough, he realized that it was the three fishermen, and they were walking on water. And they came within speaking distance, and they said, oh, we hear your boat go past, and we came to meet you, and please, so sorry, but we forgot your lovely prayer. Um, please, so sorry, could you tell us, tell us again we forgot? What was it? And then, of course, the bishop, quite humbled, said, go back home, my friends, and each time you pray, say, we are three, you are three, have mercy upon us. <laughs> This is a story, really, of the power of intention. Uh, that what matters is not doing things right. Doesn't matter if we do things according to the book or what we expect or what others expect. What matters is the quality of heart and integrity we bring to what we do. It's that simple. It's, what matters is remembering what we care about as many moments of our life as possible. And really this is the theme of, of tonight, that the more we remember what matters, the more our life becomes organized around that, becomes an expression of that. So what we find is that when our words and our thoughts and our actions arise out of that remembering, uh, that what matters is love, or what matters is truth, what matters is presence. When, when, our, when our life is coming out of that, there's a freedom that ripples out. It's healing for others. And conversely, when our words and actions come out of a sense of, of grasping or fear, um, we create suffering for ourselves and others. So in, the, in Buddhist psychology, uh, the power of intention is considered right at the center of the path. So in a way you might consider um, tonight's talk that the path to nirvana is paved with good intentions, okay? <laughs> Just, if you'd like to, it's up to you. I don't know if I'm going to name it that or not. <laughs> So what is an intention, okay? An intention is the mental and emotional energy that is going towards a certain experience or outcome. And every moment, the intention is considered a neutral mental factor. Every moment intention is having us face somewhere, that where our attention goes, energy flows. So our intentions having us move to get more comfortable or move to prove something or move to protect something or move to understand something. But there's intention behind everything. Often it's unconscious. Part of vipassana, or seeing clearly this practice of mindfulness, is bringing mindfulness to that often unconscious process so we're more awake to what's driving us moment to moment. If we see it, it doesn't have as much control. In fact, if we see our intention in any moment, in that moment, there's the possibility of opening to what might be a deeper, more pure yearning. I sometimes think of it like there's, you know, a lot of waves on the surface and we get, we spend a lot of moments of our life being tugged around by them, driven by them. 
But if we begin to notice the waves, we actually open to a much deeper, more vast, more peaceful space where, where a more pure kind of intention arises for us. So we can see what happens on a very um, more superficial level with intention, that if, if you're on a road trip, okay, and you're hungry, you know that what you're watching is for the signs for the restaurants, right? You're not looking at the silhouettes of the trees and the way the sunset, you're kind of checking out which restaurant you want to go to if you're hungry. And if you're worried about um, an upcoming event making a good impression in some way, then when your child's talking excitedly about what happened at school, your mind is planning or rehearsing. Or as they say in India, when a pickpocket sees a saint, he sees the saint's pocket. No? Okay. So we begin to notice what is our intention. When it's to protect ourself or enhance ourself, the world becomes more narrow. The mind gets more fixated. We call this selfing sometimes in, in Buddhist lingo these days. You know, when we're in our sel- when our intentions are kind of selfing intentions, we get tighter. When our intentions is towards waking up, towards creating, serving, loving, wait, realizing, there's more of that kind of openness, receptivity. Now, it's completely natural and appropriate that a part of our energy and our intentions and attention would go towards meeting what are described as the hierarchy of needs, that we have to, it's part of our karma, our duty to take care of these bodies and minds. And so, as you know, as you imagine, food, shelter, and so on, we have to have intentionality towards. It's not like if you're in the jungle and the spears are coming at you, that you're going to start getting curious about the fauna and the bird life and so on in those moments, right? So we begin by recognizing it's natural that we protect ourselves and that we try to pursue our needs. I, as I was thinking about this, I was remembering the story of a honest seven-year-old who admitted very calmly to her parents that Billy Brown had kissed her at school after class. How did that happen, gasped her mother. And she said, well, it wasn't easy. She admitted that. She said, it took me at least three other friends to help catch him. (laughs) So we pursue. And the challenge is this, that for most of us, the suffering is, is that not that we aren't, our basic needs aren't met for food, shelter, and so on, as much as that we have become fixated, our development's gotten arrested, and we are trying to u- use substitutes to find satisfaction. And we're fixating our attention over and over and over again. There's a few ways we do it. One of them is the fixation on something's missing, my life is not enough. And that's one of the big ones, where we're, it's like we're chasing Billy Brown all the time. In some way we're strategizing to get more attention, more approval, you know, more achievements, more acquisitions, okay? There's a sense that uh, it's even around information, like I know many people have described their addiction to the internet is on some level the sense that there's another piece of information they don't have that they need to, I don't know what exactly, I'm not sure need to what, but it's that. So it's rather than presence, there's a fixation. The the intention is to get more information. For most of us, one of the big ones, you know, is, is, you know, just in some way making sure we have enough. There's one woman who writes, I love to shop after a bad relationship. I don't know. I buy a new outfit and it makes me feel better. It just does. Sometimes if I see a really great outfit, I'll break up with someone on purpose. <laughs> So one of the fixations of our intent is something's missing, have to have more. I'm going to speak a little more about the other one, which is something's wrong. 
and we get hooked on a perception that something's wrong and all of our intention is around in some way, how do I handle this? This is the problem, life is a problem to be solved mentality that a lot of us are in a lot of moments. And uh, there's a sense, you know, that the spears are going to fly at any moment and a lot of people are throwing spears at us. There's going to be the victim. Or I need to throw spears, you know, I need to protect, I need to aggress. And so this is the, these are the intentions behind war. And how to be more secure. So we go into judgment a lot. Judgment is a big one. Because most of the time the intention comes back to self, it's not just something's wrong, it's something's wrong with me. A lot of our intentions in life grow out of that basic perception something is wrong with me. And I'm putting this out there for you just to consider as you say, okay, I'm going to be more mindful of my intention. Well, what's going on right now? And you'll find that in some way you're trying to pull yourself out of the red, I think. Make up for not okay self. So this is, I think, the most persistent fear that shapes our intention. Uh, something's wrong with me, my intelligence, my personality, my body, my career, my, I'm not a good parent, I'm not a good friend, I'm not a good child. Something's wrong with my mind. And then out of this work, our intention's always, how can I show a, be- a better self? You know, how can I enhance myself? For many of us, our intention is to improve ourself. Now that seems pretty benign, doesn't it? Okay, I just want to improve myself. And yet even in spiritual life, this sense of I want to improve, I want to become a better something, actually has a real hook in it. Because it continuously reaffirms, right now I'm not enough. That's what we're saying. I remember the story about a woman going into Barnes & Noble saying, she says, I went to the bookstore the other day, I asked the woman behind the counter where the self-help section was. She said, if I told you that, it would defeat the purpose, (laughs) you know. (laughs) So there's this subtle level of the intention, okay, I'm just trying to improve myself, I'm trying to learn more, I'm trying to become a more generous person, I'm trying to um, tweak my meditation, I'm, I'm trying to be better in some way. But for most of us, we also know the layer that's much more overt of really being down on ourselves. It's not just trying to improve, it's in some way uh, a deep sense of being flawed. And that's where the intentions that come out of that keep us caught in cycles of suffering. And I'll just name that a little more. Because I I suspect most of you are familiar with how it works. That we begin with some observation of how we're falling short and aversive self-judgment. Aversive self-judgment and feeling insecure. And then our ways of communicating and behaving out of that insecurity, what do they do? They create the very situations and the very sense of self we think is bad. You know, we get the responses from the world that are just confirming exactly what we're judging ourselves for. And we're caught in a loop. Feel bad about myself, out of that feeling bad, in some way try to protect or pretend or defend, create an aversive response in others, feel bad about myself. This looping and the way our thoughts and emotions loop is is sometimes described as papancha, where we're going in this chain reaction, where we're having feelings and they're like generating thoughts about ourselves and the thoughts generate more feelings and that drives us to an action and then the action creates a reaction. We're caught in a loop. Some of you might remember this from the Chinese Buddhist text, and it describes this prison that we get into. It says, from intention springs the deed, from the deed springs the habits, from the habits grow the character, from the character develops destiny. So 
So I've shared this in different forms before, but it's not until we start seeing the chain of reaction that we're living in that we can step out of it. From the intention springs the deed. What does that mean? If we are living in a sense of something's wrong with me and we have this inner energy, this movement to in some way, um, you know, more thoughts, more self-judgment, if we have this energy or movement towards in some way trying to fix ourselves or prove ourselves, and then our activities end up creating kind of reaction in the world, and then we feel worse about ourselves, and we stay in that loop, we land up in a place of suffering where we feel separate and we feel profoundly flawed. It just gets confirmed. So there's a bad news, good news about this chain of reaction. The bad news, or the difficult news, is that the more we repeat it, it's like, putting water through, a, through a, fu- a funnel or through a kind of groove and the more it digs that groove like a river till it becomes a really strong current that's very defined that's the neural pathway where we're cre- creating the more we feel this intention to prove ourselves or defend ourselves and the more we do it the more that neural pathway has strength creates a whole set of a whole network actually of thoughts and feelings we're stuck in So the bad news is that as we repeat it, the scientists put it this way, neurons that fire together, wire together, we develop this really deep patterning of feeling like a bad self and having our intentions arise out of that so that you can actually look at your day and see how many decisions, how many perceptions, how many actions actually came out of the sense of bad self. A lot. Gets organized that way. That's the difficult news. The good news is that it is possible to interrupt the chain of reactivity. Just in the way that these pathways are formed, they can be unformed. And so there's not one pattern that you have that you sense as suffering. Not one pattern whether it's a pattern of blaming other people, because that we do also, or a pattern of blaming yourself, or a pattern of feeling victimized, or whatever it is, there's not one pattern that we can't undo. So this was the invitation and the promise of the Buddha. I mean, the Buddha said, I would not teach you this Dharma if it were not possible. I would not teach you this if it were not possible to be free. So the beginning recognition in this, in this good news side of things, is actually we can't change the past. Some of you might remember Lily Tomlin saying that forgiveness is giving up all hopes for a better past. Do you remember that? (laughs) Okay, we can't, we can't, we can't change the past. There's only one place we're empowered if we want to alter these patterns. And that's right in this moment. And it's just this moment. It's not the idea of another moment. It's actually in the living moment that you can actually change your karma. Karma just means this pattern of cause and effect. What this means is that the most profound intention you can have is the intention towards presence. And I would frame it a little larger towards loving presence. Because presence can sometimes be misunderstood as aiming your attention in a kind of a harsh way on the moment. But loving presence has the softness that really allows us to inhabit the moment. That's the most profound intention you can have if you want to be all that you are, if you want the freedom from the limiting beliefs, if you want to really live and love fully, right here. So the good news is that right here and now, if we train ourselves to pause in the midst of a chain reaction, now we're getting down to the nits and grits, this is how change happens. 
You're in a chain reaction. You just did something that reminded you of a flaw. You just did something where you said something with another person that you regretted. You did something that reminds you of how your, your mind is not working well. You did some addictive behavior that is confirmation that you're out of control. You said something hurtful to a child and, or just have that sinking feel, you know, crushing feeling of being a bad parent, whatever it is. You're about to set off that chain reaction where your intention becomes to either badger yourself and try to condemn yourself into changing, because that's what self-judgment is. We're trying, to, we're trying to slam ourselves into being better. Or your intention is to defend yourself so other people can't see what you did. Or whatever it is, instead of that, you pause. Okay, the pause is priceless. I remember one AA sponsor said that a learning to pause for five seconds was worth a year of meetings. This is a sponsor that had been in, in for decades. Now, he knew it's not an either-or. It's a both-end. But pausing is precious. All the possibility becomes available in a pause. Okay, so that's the first step. We pause. And then we listen to deepen our intention. We sense our intention for presence and love in that moment of the pause. Awareness alters the patterning. I'm going to read you... um, This is from Rumi. Sometimes you hear a voice through the door calling you as a fish out of water hears the surfs come back. This turn toward what you deeply love saves you. When you're caught in reactivity, when you're getting nervous, anxious, and speedy, when you're getting judgmental, when you're turning on yourself, when you're turning on another, when you're feeling some, somebody said something that wounded you and you're recoiling, any of those kind of things, if there can be a remembering to pause, in that pause you can hear the voice that Rumi talks about that says, come back. In that pause there's a little bit of pr- more presence that allows you to turn back towards what you love rather than playing out the chain of reactivity that keeps us locked in that small, separate, victimized self. Is this resonating for you? Okay. All right, we'll keep going now. Now, the meditation practices that we do, where we learn to wake up from thoughts and come back, where we learn to keep coming back to presence is the core training. Meditation is a training in remembrance. But what we're remembering is not like an event that happened. We're remembering to be here. So that strengthens the muscle. If we can come back, we can get in touch with a deeper intention. Otherwise, we're actually being driven by more surface waves that are saying, oh, got to have more of this, got to be more comfortable, got to get this done, got to, you know, we're we're driven by that. In a moment of pausing, ah, there's a voice that calls us home, a little more audible, 